Hello and welcome to Exploited Crimes and Technology. My name is Opal Singleton and I am the host of your show. We come to you every Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock right here on AM 590, The Answer. Well, we are busier than a one-armed paper hanger. It is crazy out here, folks, with this COVID thing. We have so many cases going on right now locally. As many of you that follow this show know, this show is brought to you by Million Kids, M-I-L-L-I-O-N, Million Kids, because more than a million kids are trafficked each year throughout the world. So right here in the Inland Empire, we have been combating trafficking since 2008, and uh, we report to the Riverside County Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force, That is an amazing group of men and women, and I cannot tell you how proud I am to serve with them. This is men and women who go out after the worst of the worst. I'm telling you, anybody who sells somebody else's body, and when that body is a child's body, it doesn't get any worse than that. And uh, I'm very, very proud to serve with uh, Sheriff Chad Bianco and and uh, the whole task force over there. The, he has a new sergeant, Sergeant Minchaka. Minchaka, I said that wrong. I better get that right. I report to him. I met him this week. I'm very, very impressed with him. We have 13 people, and they are out there protecting your kids. We have uh, three new cases. These are coming out of the RCAT East, the, the East um uh, Uh, County uh, Task Force, but I want to make you aware of them. In this one case, the headline, Human Trafficking of a Minor, the uh, perpetrator is Carlos Beltran. And uh, in his case, he was picked up out in Thermal. He's 50 years old. He is being charged with unlawful sexual intercourse with a minor, oral copulation, and possession of a controlled substance. And uh, he is part of the case that I talked about a couple of weeks ago, where uh, the perpetrator is Jose Manuel Pimentel. And in his case, he was arrested for human trafficking of a minor, pimping of a minor, pandering of a minor, unlawful sexual intercourse with a minor, and oral copulation and other felony charges. You may start to get the idea of what's really going on here is we have two adult males that are forcing teenage kids into commercial sex and exploiting them and representing them, and that is called sex trafficking under California law. We also have another case here where they did a demand reduction scheme. Yes, selling sex in California is against the law. This took place out in La Quinta, and in the course of that, in a very short period of time, 17 men were arrested. If you want to see who they are, this will be posted at Me and Kids. These are average people who think that it's okay to go out and have sex, and in some cases, sex with a minor. And finally, we have a third case here where Maximiliano Martinez, 33 of Palm Desert, was arrested. Uh, He was arrested along with the assistance of the Coachella Valley Violent Crime Gang Task Force. It is a felony arrest charged with human trafficking of a minor, pimping of a minor, pandering of a minor, unlawful sexual intercourse with a minor, oral copulation. If you know anything about a situation with uh, the gang, uh, task force once being uh, notified, situation involving Maximiliano Martinez out in the desert, please call anonymous 760 760- Three four one stop seven six zero three four one stop and uh, or you can contact me at opal o p a l at millionkids dot org and we will make that connection. Very very proud to have them in our lives out here. Our county is the safer county. While we're at it though, I want to give a hats off over to San Bernardino County Task Force. They're excellent. I happen to report to Riverside, so I'm a little bit prejudiced, a little bit persuaded one way or the other, but the 
folks over in the San Bernardino Task Force are great, too. Uh, that is Sergeant O'Brien, Michael O'Brien over there. And uh, Captain Mahoney uh, works with them, too, out of Rancho. So very lucky to have solid people who want to make a difference. So we deal with human trafficking. If you want to know more about our services for Million Kids, you can find it at millionkids.org. We're setting up a new uh, website. It'll come out in the next two weeks. And at the same time, uh, we are going to be setting up insider alerts. So if you want specialized training where you're notified of all these cases and I dissect and uh, analyze them for you, then join, go to meandkids.org, plug in your name and uh, join our newsletter. And we will be offering you out the insider alert very shortly. So I have a guest, uh, and I really want to take more time with this guest and uh, get right into it. This is going to be a complex show, so buckle up for you. Um, Our guest, his first name is Ian. I get that really well. But his last name is Oxnab. Oxnab. I've been practicing it. I'm still struggling with it. Ian, welcome aboard. You want to say your own name? (laughs) Oxnavad. Oxnavad. I was close, but I wasn't right. I knew I wasn't. Okay, uh, Ian, we have about four minutes to break. Let tell the folks who you are and and why you're here today. Uh, so I'm a professor. I'm a political scientist and a political economist. Right now, I am teaching at UC Irvine this year in their poli sci department. Uh, my research, though, relates to areas of overlap between security issues, anywhere from states combating other states to terrorism to criminal organizations, issues of security with overlapping issues of economics. So things like uh, why one country will target the currency of another country, economic sanctions, terrorist financing, money laundering, uh, economic intelligence, financial warfare, corporate espionage, things of that nature. And I discovered recently an area of overlap where counter-terrorist financing laws could easily be retrofitted as a model for combating human trafficking and the money laundering that goes along with it. Wow. That that's going to be interesting. I've uh, been tracking human trafficking and money laundering for some time, so uh, I really want to get into it with this show. You you actually started out heavily, and your your background is heavily in combating terrorism, right? Uh, uh, that's mainly what you do. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I, you make it sound a little more glamorous than that. I have no law enforcement <laughs> background or any military background or anything like that. Uh, but I do research it heavily. I did, I've done work on ISIS and how ISIS was using gold to launder money and how it dressed the whole thing up in Islamic law, even though it actually made no sense, according to Islamic law, the way they were doing it. Uh, and uh, in issues related to that, I've done some work on Somalia and uh, also banks and how banks launder money for terrorist groups, why certain banks get away with it and other banks do not. I actually have a book under contract right now with McGill Queens University Press that should be coming out shortly uh, that examines that very fact, why certain banks get away with laundering money, even though it's pretty evident that they do get uh, launder money for terrorists, why they do get away with it and other banks do not. And Mm -hmm. this is a very, in academia anyway, this is a very unresearched, under-researched area. A lot of it's just case studies that don't really build any theory that can guide the understanding of future cases. So what I did was I drew from theories of security studies and theories from economics to try to create theories that can help people like yourself, law enforcement, intelligence agencies, et cetera, navigate these crises and these issues as they arise. Well, you know, I often think that myself. Uh, I would agree wholeheartedly so far with what you've said because of the fact that it's often the pattern of the transaction rather than the details of the transaction. And I see that whether you're talking about money laundering or sex laundering or sex laundering, uh, sex trafficking related to money laundering or even drug trafficking related to sex trafficking. And then wherever money is produced, they need to move it. And uh, the bottom line is, is that 
that uh, it, uh, oftentimes it isn't necessarily the original crime, but the fact that in the end they have a lot of money. And, and let's face it, sex trafficking is really about the money. Absolutely. It's uh, any criminal enterprise for profit has to launder money as opposed to terrorist financing is a little different because unlike criminal proceeds where you have purely illicit profit that then has to be laundered, quote unquote, in order to become usable in the regular economy, terrorist financing actually has to do with money dirtying and can encompass clean and dirty money before it goes into a future crime, a.k.a. terrorism. I would agree. Folks, this is Opal Singleton and Ian Oxnavad, and uh, we were up against that break, so we're going to be right back. Real estate sales in the Inland Empire are really hot. Sellers and buyers recognize that these low interest rates will not last. Sean and Colleen at Caldwell Banker Armstrong Properties in Riverside are proud to sponsor this show. They are the best in the Inland Empire. They're fair, honest, creative, and they care about you and your situation. If you're in the market to buy or sell a home, call Sean and Colleen at 951-529-4066. Hello, this is Opal Singleton of Exploited Crimes and Technology. Hey, there are many good restaurants in the Inland Empire, but really great restaurants are hard to find. Let me tell you about the Toasted Barrel in Corona. It's a trendy, upscale steakhouse with great pasta and seafood. It's a fantastic choice for birthdays and anniversaries or just that special night out with your loved one and friends. Inland Empire Magazine has awarded them best restaurant and brunch for the past three years. The owners, Ed and Shirley, are friendly and attentive to your needs. If you're a prime rib connoisseur, this place is for you. Go ahead and try it out. The Toasted Barrel, located at 1300 El Sobrante Road in Corona. Or Google them at Toasted Barrel to make reservations. I guarantee you, you're going to love it. Be sure and tell Ed and Shirley that Opal sent you. It will be a night you'll never forget. Societal Shift, A World Without Borders and a Home Without Walls. This is the most important book you will read this year, especially if you have children or grandchildren. We are living at the most important time in all of history. In 2020, the entire world will be connected by internet, more than six billion people coming together. Technology will provide many great advantages for our kids, but a world without borders for our kids is also a world without borders for pimps, predators, pedophiles, cartels, and organized crime. It is a home without walls because 87% of the kids sleep with their phone. It is the greatest societal experiment of all time. Our kids are technology geniuses and their parents are technophobic. Some are techno impotent. New apps come with no warnings on how a predator will use them against our kids. Advancing technologies like encrypted messaging, vaporware, artificial intelligence, cryptocurrency, and the dark net will challenge law enforcement, teachers, and parents to keep kids safe. Recent research states that 9,000 kids a day are being blackmailed with a naked photo and 58% will meet their predator. It is indeed a societal shift and one in which most parents are unprepared. If you are a parent or grandparent, teacher, counselor, or social worker, please take time to read Societal Shift. Only $18.99 plus $6 shipping. Order today at millionkids.org. That's millionkids, M-I-L-L-I-O-N-K-I-D-S dot org. It'll be the greatest gift you can give your family and yourself. Order Societal Shift today. Million Kids takes checks and credit cards. Opal Singleton, the author, will personally sign the book and send it to you. Again, go to millionkids.org and order Societal Shift today. Join Million Kids. Keep our kids safe from predators. AM 590, the answer. Hello and welcome back to Exploited Crimes and Technology. This is Opal Singleton and we have a guest today, Ian Oxnavad, and we are going to be talking about global money laundering. Before we do that, though, I want to stop and encourage you all to help us support this show and also the work of Million Kids. I know that many of you that follow this show, you write to me, you support us financially so that we can make this happen. And quite frankly, folks, I need it worse than I've ever needed it in my life. I am so busy with cases of kids that are missing or being exploited, that are being blackmailed. It is insane since we have so many kids online right now and being unsupervised. So we're having a fundraiser. 
If you will go this Saturday, Saturday, today, you still have time yet to do it, goes clear into midnight. If you will go to your nearest Panda Express, okay, Panda Express, I don't care which one. Oh, actually, you order it online at Panda Express location, and it's only online that this works. Place your order anytime this Saturday and pick it up or have it delivered. And I need to give you this code. Now, this is going to be on our website, but I need you to write it down. 901-003. 901-003. So it's not too late. You still have time for dinner. Take your little wife out or maybe your husband and maybe your children and take your aunts and uncles and grandmas and bring in the whole community because we get a portion of every sale. Okay. Okay. Order online from any Panda Express, use code 901-003, and they will give us a significant donation. We ran this last month and was extremely helpful, and many of you did it, and so I'd appreciate it. So enough of that. At this point, I want to return to Ian. I was very excited to meet him over the phone because I have had a passion about money laundering connected to sex trafficking for a very long time. Uh, one, one of the things that you've heard me talk about here in Southern California is we've had five major foreign national ranks, uh, mostly Chinese, some Taiwanese, some Korean, and are generating tens of millions of dollars in, uh, in proceeds. And it's all about money laundering. Now, Ian and I, we don't know each other real well yet. I think that'll change. But uh, one of the things that fascinated me was he studied this having to do with terrorism and uh, extremism and sees a pattern here that can be adapted to other crimes. So with that, Ian, take it away. (laughs) Thanks. So you had asked about basically the difference between money laundering, how money laundering works versus terrorist financing. And I kind of alluded to it before where you have money laundering is essentially trying to distance the monies gained from illegal activity from that illegal activity so that they can then be used in the overt economy, right? Mm -hmm. So it can be invested so you can actually buy things with it. Now, there's three phases to money laundering. The first is placement, then there's layering, and then there's integration. Now, the placement phase is where that illicit money first enters the above board economy. It needs some sort of entry point. Now, that can be a front business, a cash business. It could be under invoicing or over invoicing for something. And then it gets layered That layering phase is what most people think of when they think of the money laundering phase. And just as a quick aside, it's kind of interesting that one of the apocryphal stories, not 100 percent sure if it's true, but the story goes that the term money laundering actually comes from Al Capone, who had supposedly these coin laundries that he would launder illicit proceeds from bootlegging through in order to use the money legally. Mm -hmm. Um, But that layering phase is where that money moves around from one entity to another through multiple transactions or through multiple media of values, right? So you could buy, let's say you have $100,000 worth of illegally gained money from drugs or human trafficking that goes into a heavily cash business, let's say a nightclub. Nightclubs are great. It's kind of a cliche, but nightclubs are great for laundering money because they're high, heavy cash businesses. They're right. fairly ephemeral. They don't last very long, and you could launder a lot of cash through that, have it go onto the books, and then move it around through different means. Let's say you buy $100,000 worth of art with that money, then you can exchange that. That can change hands, and then you can actually sell that again. Maybe you turn it into casino chips or what have you, and then ultimately you can invest that $100,000 into real estate, and that's where it gets integrated back into the above-board economy. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's those are the three phases. Now, on a, on a side note with money laundering, one of the really dangerous things about it, and you see this in Latin America, is that it can distort aspects of the economy in such a way that it actually hurts legal enterprises or ab- above board actors. So a lot of money specifically from narcotics in Latin America gets invested into real estate. 
-hmm. in Central and South America. So what that does is that inflates prices of real estate so that many above board business people or regular people can't afford real estate in a lot mm -hmm. of markets. Right. So it actually has a exponentially detrimental effect to an economy. And of course, it can enable corruption and then eventually law and order breaks down and you wind up with exponentially growing problems in terms of security, rule of law and just public safety. Mm -hmm. Now, money launder or money laundering is different from terrorist financing in that the money originating in terrorist financing could be legal or illegal in its origins. So you could have a terrorist gang, for example, that may deal drugs. Um, I think it was Spain. They, they had a, uh, a jihadist gang, affiliated gang that then radicalized, but they were self-funding through criminal activity and they committed some bombings in the early 2000s. And then you have other uh, legal money that can actually come from legal businesses. So, for mm -hmm. example, in Northern Ireland, um, in the past, security firms have worked with the IRA, and these are perfectly above board you know, enterprises that is a legal means of potentially funding terrorism. You also have mm -hmm. nonprofits, charity organizations, or even state funding that can come through different means. Um, in one case, Iran funneled money to Palestinian terrorist groups through China. And the way that they did it was pretty ingenious. The money went through China and then was used to buy toys. The toys were then shipped to the Palestinian territories. And then those toys were then auctioned off for cash. So mm -hmm. the value actually uh, changed hands, but not any real money. And mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily show up on books unless you have surveil the entire chain of value. Uh, but the, the money can come from above board businesses. It can come from charities. It can come from illegal activity. And that money mixes together and then goes to a future crime. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Is that and is that when integration takes place? In well, with terrorism, it's it's different because the the cost of terrorism works differently in that you're dealing with. If you think of criminal organizations that are profit motivated, they're much more like corporations. Terrorist groups are much more like nonprofits. There can be a lot of money in it, but they're actually not after an economic goal. They're actually after an intangible economic goal. They're after a political goal. Mm -hmm. or potentially mm -hmm. a religious goal. So uh, it can be integrated and then that money can be used to facilitate future operations or it can be used to procure weapons for an attack. Mm -hmm. When uh, we come back from the break, I want to talk about the case of Jerry Wang out of uh, San Gabriel. It was a five-person uh, sex trafficking ring that ran from uh, Ventura all the way out here in the Inland Empire, even out in the desert and down to San Diego. And they literally have 50 different bank accounts and nine different banks, and they were buying and selling real estate to launder all the money. This is all taking place through sex trafficking as these Chinese and uh, Korean, South, South Korean women were brought in and uh, put out for prostitution in our communities. And sex buyers participated, they, they paid the money, and then all that money came together and ended up being bought and sold through real estate. And that was my first encounter with sex trafficking and money laundering. Uh, and so basically what you're saying is real estate, a real estate transaction is just part of the cleaning process for something like that. Yes, or the integration. Now, there is a way to retrofit strategies to combat terrorist financing to combat human trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, like the, the way that the legal system works is you have, through terrorist financing laws, there's two forms of reporting that banks have to do, currency transaction reports and suspicious activity reports. Currency mm -hmm. transaction reports a bank has to file a report with the Financial Intelligence Unit, in this case, the Department of the Treasury, for any transaction above $10,000. Right. And in this case, they were doing a lot of private lending, and that's probably how they were able to launder it. Uh, this is Opal Singleton. The show is Exploited Crimes and Technology. We are up against the break, so we're going to ask you to stay with us. We're going to be right back. Hello, this is Opal Singleton of Exploited Crimes and Technology. I want to tell you about a book I wrote called Seduced, The Grooming of America's Teenagers. It's all about how predators access, groom, recruit, and exploit our young people using social media, online gaming, 
video chat rooms. Technology is changing at the speed of light, and we have to understand how to keep our kids safe from predators. So you can get this book by going to www.meandkids.org. It's $16. I'll sign it, and I'll ship it to you personally. We hope that you will order this book, Educate Yourself About How to Keep Our Kids Safe in This Day of Changing Technology. Join us each Saturday for our radio show at Exploited Crimes and Technology at 3 o'clock on AM 590, The Answer. Hello and welcome back to Exploited Crimes and Technology. My guest today is Ian Oxnavad, and he is uh, in Southern California. He is absolutely an expert. Uh, He is a political scientist and political economist, teaches at UC Irvine, which I just did myself this week. He has a PhD in political science from University of California, an MA in national security studies, and a BA in Arabic. Oh, my. His research focuses on overlapping issues of economic and security and an area of threat finance. So before we go too much farther on this, I w- we were talking about a case Um, when we were offline here, the case that I started telling you about of Jerry Wang out of um, San Gabriel. Now, literally, they were taking back loans between private parties and like that and buying and selling real estate. There are three other cases in which money laundering took place because of the size of the sex trafficking rings in our community. There is uh, the uh, the case of Sophia Navas, her case, they had over 20,000 sex ads. And again, they were bringing in women from China and Korea and putting them in massage parlors and moving them across the country for private sex ads. When you have 20,000 sex ads, okay, that is a whole lot of sex selling. Uh, easily an ad can generate 15, 20, 30, 40 customers. So these are huge rings. If you get nothing else out of this today, I want you to see in the bottom line, this is all about making money, taking your money, the people who are buying the sex. And in many cases, in another case that we had a Thai case out of LA, they were, all the money was going back to Bangkok and Belgium. These are big, big money cases. You may seem like it's just a small little massage partner in your area, but it's all about abusing other people to make a lot of money. So my guest today is Ian, and he is a specialist about how do they clean up the money that they make in selling sex and what do they do with it? And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Ian. (laughs) Thank you. Um, So as I was telling you briefly before about how money laundering works, the way that there's actually an entire surveillance system in the financial industry as a result of multiple laws that have been passed since the Bank Secrecy Act of 1970. And basically, there's two aspects of it. One is the reporting aspect, and the other is the intelligence aspect. Now, the reporting aspect of it, any amount above $10,000, a bank or financial institution has to file something called a currency transaction report. Right. Then, and if there is a suspicious uh, activity, for example, anything with onboarding, anybody who opens a bank account, whether it be a business or an individual, the bank has to know something about you. They're actually obligated through something called Know Your Customer Regulations and Laws, KYC laws, that mandate that the bank knows who's actually, you know, they need to know something about the account holder and the activities that they do, the normal activities. So, mm-hmm. for example, if something deviates from that, maybe, for example, you're a dentist and all of a sudden you're sending wire transfers from your account or sending money to Yemen. Uh, you know, if you're a dentist in Milwaukee, that's going to be a little <laughs> weird, especially <laughs> if you have no connection financially to Yemen or for example, it's my if, wife's mother. <laughs> yes, it's always the mother-in-law. If, if, uh, or for example, if you're a nail salon in the Atlanta area, and all of a sudden you're spending money on big rigs, 
that, mm-hmm. that's going to raise some red flags. So what happens then is the bank then files something called a suspicious activity report. Now, in, within the bank, there's actually something called a financial intelligence unit. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, the financial intelligence unit is basically just an office within the bank that's made up of compliance officers who then manage and watch for all of this suspicious activity. They check things for uh, if see if an entity is sanctioned on a sanctions list or if somebody uh, might be on a terrorist watch list or something like that or if something's just out of the ordinary. They file these reports to the government's financial intelligence unit. In this case, in the US, it's the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network that's at Mm -hmm. the Department of the Treasury. Mm -hmm. Then the Department of the Treasury files through all of these things, they funnel through all of them and flip through all of them. And if it looks like it's worthwhile and following up, then they will then liaison with one of the law enforcement agencies at the local or national level to investigate further and maybe take some sort of legal action. Mm-hmm. So that's how that system works. So most let people me, aren't aware of it. But. Let me interrupt you a second sure. here. Um, I don't want you to lose your train of thought, but as I was reading all this at 5 a.m. this morning, I thought to myself, you know, we've all moved to uh, using our cell phones to make deposits. And uh, so there's going to be a lot less of that because there's a lot less bank managers and personal interaction. Do you think that'll affect it? Uh, it can. And in order to and this is one of the things that's la- it's perpetually lacking in the compliance field or in terms of the you know financial intelligence area is that a lot of transactions are going to vary from one place to another because any ac- any economic activity is ultimately going to have some sort of cultural nuance to it that you're going to have to understand if you're going to want to see what deviates from the norm. Mm-hmm. So you can't just blanket say, well, you know, this jurisdiction is bad, you know, and then all right. of a sudden regular people can't get access to bank accounts from yeah, that area right. and it can cripple an entire economy. And that's actually kind of like Facebook, you know, when they cut you off <laughs> a little bit. It's very it's very blanket. And the, I got cut off this last week, so I'm hurting and I feel lost. But go ahead. <laughs> right. So the you know, it actually takes some sort of knowledge because. The, and this is where the cultural nuance matters and the political background matters because, you know, things vary from place to place, even how we see wealth. An economist will say, well, everyone desires to be wealthy. Well, sure, that's universal. But what that looks like from one person to another is going to have a lot of cultural influence. Sure. What what one person sees is, well, I want money. You know, they may want room service you know, and, and limitless hotels in Vegas. Another person may want to retire quietly to a mountaintop. You know, Mm -hmm. maybe somebody else just wants to pay for an operation for a family member. It's going to vary from culture to culture and from circumstance to circumstance. And that you actually have to have that awareness in order to tell what's deviant from what's just regular business transactions. So how do we, uh, you know, look at at uh, money laundering with all the technology changes coming on it seems like to me uh we're it's almost like we're going to be moneyless pretty soon everything's going to be electronic data at some point they're already telling us they're out of coins and uh and short of uh, bills so uh, how do you deal with crimes related to money laundering for the future well a lot of people kind of see it, they focus on the medium of value rather than the fact that it's actually the movement of value. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to, and that's and that's what's key to understanding all of this. Just because you may have a certain amount of currency or transaction or Bitcoin or whatever, it doesn't mean that the, 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 the dynamic changes, you're still going to have transactions of value. And if they get rid of, you know, quote unquote, legal cash, there's mm-hmm. still going to be some underground means of currency that's used. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for example, Somalia, the, the state has you know collapsed in the early 1990s. Private actors continued to print the currency and they still use their own currency, even mm-hmm. though there's no legal, quote unquote, currency. Uh, there, there always will be different forms of value exchanged. It's just mm-hmm. the, the nature of economic activity. So I don't see how technology really changes that all that much. It just creates more uh, potential mediums of exchange rather than actually changing money laundering itself. Yeah, it could be poker chips for all that goes. Yeah, it actually could be. 
Yeah. Well, coming back into uh, the next section, one of the things that I want to talk about that I uh, maybe just because it's where my head and heart is right now, I'm developing a, a new presentation called the Vortex. And a, of course, we have a movie coming out shortly uh, on this whole concept of where the social media is going. One of the things that's really come to my uh, head here is the the fact that everything is moving from straight street prostitution to online webcam sex and in big, big numbers. And I say to myself, this is perfect for money laundering. Por uh, the Pornhub, which is the largest porn site in the world, had 5 billion views in a month. Okay. Um, 42 billion visitors often a year, over 115 million a day. One webcam sex operation has over 40 million views a day, and they are charging for that. And the banks are charging about 15% to process that. That tells you that in private chat rooms, the host retains about 40 to 50% of the profits. By the way, that's starting to sound like a pimp to me. But my point is, these people are generating tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars by webcam sex and amateur pornography. And I really want to talk next segment about how that might tie in. We are up against that break, so stay with us. We'll be right back. This message is all about Million Kids, the organization that helps locate missing kids throughout Southern California and educates to keep kids safe from predators. Million Kids educates school administrators, teachers, parents, and teenagers how predators identify a potential victim and the methods they use to recruit innocent kids. BMW of Riverside is a proud supporter of Million Kids. Visit BMW of Riverside at the Adams Street exit off the 91 freeway or click bmwofriverside.com. Hello, this is Opal Singleton of Exploited Crimes and Technology. Let me tell you about my friend Doris Anderson at Remax Realty in Upland. She is amazing. She's kind, she's patient, but she listens and she's informed and she will help you with your real estate transaction in a way that works for you. Doris, in full disclosure, often supports the work of Million Kids because she cares about young people but she knows how to analyze a market, how to market a property, and how to find just the right transaction for both buyers and sellers. If you're looking to buy or sell real estate or invest in income property, contact Doris Anderson at Remax Realty 951-733-8899. That's 951-733-8899. 8899 Custom Service Systems, a proud supporter of Million Kids, is a family-owned and operated commercial cleaning company servicing the Inland Empire and surrounding areas since 1974. CSS takes pride in their ability to maintain the business facilities they serve and their long-lasting relationships with their valued clients. CSS provides a variety of cleaning systems customized to client needs, including deep cleaning and disinfectant to be COVID-19 compliant. From basic office cleaning to windows and floors, CSS will clean up your mess so you don't have to stress. Custom Service Systems cares about families and communities and wants to give back. Custom Service Systems are proud supporters of Million Kids to keep kids safe from predators. If you need the best cleaning services for your business or corporation, contact Custom Service Systems at cssclean.com. Again, cssclean.com or call 951-781-9345. That's 951-781-9345. You will know you found the best. Custom Service Systems. AM 590, the answer. Hello and welcome back to Exploited Crimes and Technology. This is Opal Singleton. I want to remind you, you still have time today on Saturday to contact your local Panda Express location order up anything that you want either online or through your app however you do it and use the code 901003 if you forget that number go to millionkids.org and pick up your code and 28% of everything you spend at Panda Express on that day alone provided you order online and use code 901003 we will be able to receive funding and we will love you for it so we have uh, a guest today who's really an expert and I was just talking about the 
amount of money that's about to be made and is being made as we speak on online chat rooms, webcam sex. And he was saying that that can be combated by a look at the change of legislation. So, Ian, would you walk us through what you were telling me earlier? Yeah, uh, sure. So with the Anti-Terrorism Act of 1990, basically what happened was with any victim or the family, family members of victims of terrorism can sue in civil court for civil liabilities, any financial entity or facilitating entity of terrorism. So basically any financial institution that launders money for a terrorist group, if an attack has occurred, you know, and it looks like that bank is involved, the victims of that attack or their relatives can actually sue those entities for civil liabilities. They can actually sue for damages. Now, all that needs to be done in order to combat human trafficking is to replicate that for human trafficking. And mm -hmm. the reason it's actually should be more effective, hypothetically, uh, for this is because you have more types of actors involved. So if you're laundering money for terrorism, you may just have a bank or a couple of businesses involved, but human trafficking is logistically way more complicated because you're talking about living people. You're mm -hmm. talking about housing them, feeding them, moving them. Uh, right. You know, you could have trucking companies, hotels, casinos, uh, websites such as Pornhub or any of these others. If you retrofit the legislation to combat terrorist financing for human trafficking and open them up to civil liabilities, the survivors of human trafficking or their relatives potentially could sue for damages, and that would disrupt the logistical support system that human trafficking relies on. So if you look at uh, the current State Department numbers of the most recent ones, we have about 25 million people in the world mm -hmm. that live in, a, in an actual state of slavery or mm -hmm. a condition of slavery that's about twice the population of Portugal or Greece. Uh, that's a that's a huge disruption to the illicit economy if you change those laws just in the United States alone. Wow. You know, I, I suddenly have visions of how that might look. I, I saw an advertising. I can't remember where I was, whether I was in California or I was traveling, but it was against a, uh, like a class action suit against the Catholic Church and the victims of sexual abuse that have been reported. And so really uh, what you're talking about is modifying the money laundering uh, legislation so that the victims, wherever they are, uh, can sue and, and gain some compensation. Yes, and not just for the end user. You're not just talking about going after the actual slavers themselves or the actual people doing the buying. You're actually talking about suing all of the entities that are involved in supporting it so that they do not support it in the future. So That's it makes such it an important point, Ian. Uh, I, I mean, I because what often happens, just like in the case of uh, Sophia Navas, she's in very large ring, but she's now in prison. I'm sure her assets have been compromised and like that. But that money is going back to China. Um, in the case of the Thai deal, that money's going back to Bangkok. And in the case of many of our drug and and uh, sex trafficking deals here, it's going back to the Mexican cartels. Uh, but there are banks and there are facilitators that make that happen. Uh, yes. And you, if you drive up the cost, the risk of any hotel chain or trucking company or whatever that could potentially support human trafficking, even if they're not actively involved in the end use or the actual kidnapping or anything like that, that's going to drive up the cost of the traffickers mm -hmm. and it will make it more expensive for the ultimate end product. You can't just attack it morally. You actually have to attack this problem economically to make it less economically viable. And what's interesting about the terrorist financing laws and the money laundering laws is that since 9-11, most countries in the world have pretty much adopted a variation of the U.S. law. And because mm -hmm. of its the U.S.'s size and its financial industry, a lot of transactions they may think have nothing to do with the U.S. actually pass through the U.S., Mm -hmm. So that yes, actually opens that actually opens up uh, it potentially rings in Thailand to exposure to civil liabilities or China or anywhere else. If they have some sort of financial footprint here at all uh, or any assets here at all, then then, yes, that would open them up to liability and drive up the cost of doing business, which then hurts the business itself. 
Yeah, we're we're seeing a couple of cases. This one came out of Denver where they were using sex tra- trafficking proceeds, large uh, Asian ring and uh, proceeds to um, launder uh, and use uh, do illegal pot grow, which they do in Colorado. And they were paying for, you know, the million dollars electrical bill in that. And it was all going and, and these particular Asian people spoke Spanish and the money was all going back to the Mexican cartel. So you're seeing a lot of different combinations. I saw one case out of, uh, El Monte where he was from India using the Hawala method, method basically built on trust. Um, to launder Mexico drug trafficking money through Canada, but going through El Monte. So you see a lot of that. Uh, Ian, uh, do you want to plug your book at all? Or um, if people want to reach you, they can contact me if you want, or you can give your address. Uh, well, they can go ahead and contact you if, uh, okay. if they want to. Mm-hmm. But um, the book that I have under contract now, uh, it's called Making a Killing, States, Banks, and Terrorism. Um, uh-huh. It's under contract with McGill Queens University Press, and okay. uh, it should be out early next year at some point. Okay. Well, we would, uh, I know myself, I'll be one of the first that I want to see that. So if you want to contact uh, Ian, you can just write to me at opal, O-P-A-L, at millionkids.org, and I'll make a connection. If you're aware of any kind of uh, something that you think is money laundering out there in in, uh, Southern California, let us know that. I can't promise you that you're going to get, you know, immediate investigation. I work in human trafficking, but we will try to pay attention to it because so many times these things are intertwined. And uh, you can just do that by reaching me at opal, O-P-A-L, at meandkids.org. I want to put a little disclaimer in there. I am not law enforcement and I am not 911, so do not be contacting me if you think we're going to drop everything and come out tonight. <laughs> that isn't going to happen. Uh, but we will, you know, if you're aware of something, we'll, we'll uh, get it off to the right experts and at least maybe uh, have them take a look at it. Uh, well, I want to thank you, Ian, for coming on. I really appreciate your expertise. This has been something I've been interested in for a very long time. I want to remind everybody, folks out here, please go to Panda Express yet tonight. Uh, order online. You don't go in. You order online, and then you pick it up, okay? If you're from California, you don't get a choice anyway. They're not going to allow you that choice. <laughs> Anyway, so order online, use coupon code 901003, and we will receive 28% of the cost of your dinner, and we appreciate it. If you want to support the work of me and kids, I'll tell you, you would just be my hero. These are the toughest days we've ever had. Uh, We've been nine months now without making a live presentation. I am Zooming to a point where, I mean, all day long, sometimes seven hours a day I Zoom now. And we're still training lots of people, and we have a lot of need that we need to be able to support to help some parents, to get some guidance out there, to continue to educate. Go to millionkids.org. The other thing I would share with you is please go to millionkids.org. If you're there, hit that donate button to give us your name. Uh, you may have heard that Million Kids was one of those organizations that Facebook decided to take off the air, and they took me off personally, so I don't get to talk to my family anymore. I'm going to have to look at them in person now. <laughs> you know how, how novel I do that is. Anyway, uh, we don't know why. Everybody wants to know why. If I knew why, I'd tell you, but nobody told me. Uh, we think it's probably because we promoted prop- yes on Proposition 20. We don't know. Maybe it's because we combat child pornography and we got caught up in an algorithm. But we are off Facebook. We do have a new page. Uh, it has just a small number of followers. If you want to go to me and kids on Facebook, look us up. We are not the rock band. We are the nonprofit. And give us your name, sign up, like us, and like that. But for sure, come to our website. We're taking all of our education in-house, and we want to start Me and Kids Insider. Ian, thank you for joining us. You're a wealth of knowledge, and I so much appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Okay, folks, put your arms around your kids. Tell your spouse you love them. Tell your kids you're proud of them. See you next Saturday at 3 o'clock. 
Societal Shift, A World Without Borders and a Home Without Walls. This is the most important book you will read this year, especially if you have children or grandchildren. We are living at the most important time in all of history. In 2020, the entire world will be connected by internet, more than six billion people coming together. Technology will provide many great advantages for our kids, but a world without borders for our kids is also a world without borders for pimps, predators, pedophiles, cartels, and organized crime. It is a home without walls because 87% of the kids sleep with their phone. It is the greatest societal experiment of all time. Our kids are technology geniuses and their parents are technophobic. Some are techno impotent. New apps come with no warnings on how a predator will use them against our kids. Advancing technologies like encrypted messaging, vaporware, artificial intelligence, cryptocurrency, and the dark net will challenge law enforcement, teachers, and parents to keep kids safe. Recent research states that 9,000 kids a day are being blackmailed with a naked photo and 58% will meet their predator. It is indeed a societal shift and one in which most parents are unprepared. If you are a parent or grandparent, teacher, counselor, or social worker, please take time to read Societal Shift. Only $18.99 plus $6 shipping. Order today at millionkids.org. That's millionkids, M-I-L-L-I-O-N-K-I-D-S dot org. It'll be the greatest gift you can give your family and yourself. Order Societal Shift today. Million Kids takes checks and credit cards. Opal Singleton, the author, will personally sign the book and send it to you. Again, go to millionkids.org and order Societal Shift today. Join Million Kids. Keep our kids safe from predators.